Hello, everyone. This is Mike Bryan with uh, Blog for Arizona. I'm the founder and editor, and I'm here with, today with Kirsten Engel, who is running for Congress in CD6. Welcome, Kirsten. Well, hello. Thank you. I'm glad that you're here, and I see also that you have uh, have somebody, a furry friend down there with yes, you. Yes, yes. And to introduce is, him. This is our uh, dog, Zeus. And, Get a quick uh, shot of Zeus there. Not, yeah, we hope he's not going to be barking during this, but he may. Yeah, he it's may. okay if he does. We don't mind. <laughs> he's a so good watchdog. we're here in Kirsten's lovely backyard in Sam Hughes, uh, and we're going to ask a couple of questions. Uh, Kirsten, first of all, I'd like to know, how did you realize that you wanted to serve your community specifically as a representative as opposed to any other capacity? That's a great question. And I think it's uh, really was born out of my experience, uh, you know, both being a parent of a public school student here in uh, Tucson, uh, as well as my work actually as a teacher at the University of Arizona. Uh, you know, really, I talk about this on the campaign trail all the time, but it, a really a crystallizing moment uh, happened when I was serving on the site council of my daughter's public school here. And we were trying to get money for a field trip for the kids. And it was one of these, uh, one of these things where we had to like move money around and out of, you know, one pot into another just to be able to afford, you know, renting a bus uh, for a field trip. And I just was like, this is wrong. This is crazy. Uh, we need to do something about this. Uh, you know, I grew up, you know, field trips, you know, going to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. That was like a highlight of the year. And the thought that kids would not have those kinds of opportunities because we couldn't scrape together the money was just really frustrating to me. Uh, and the other thing was, you know, I think I realized, look, you know, I have legal training. Uh, you know, I know a lot about the law and uh, I care a lot about the environment. Uh, this, the state isn't doing anything about climate change that I can see. Uh, so, you know, I have a role here and I can, I can give back and use my skills, you know, for the community. Yeah. And that's what started things off. Yeah, I can I can certainly testify and uh, sympathize that at some point every lawyer goes, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> when they're looking at a law. Absolutely. And, and I think there's a little bit of a, uh, I love teaching law and I love teaching the next generation, but, you know, I also feel like, um, you know, teaching has to move into action too. They, they should be, they should be uh, joined. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in what ways do you feel that your family, your faith, and your personal history shape your politics today? Oh, profoundly. Uh, you know, I grew up in a family of uh, teachers, and uh, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I grew up on the South Side uh, to uh, two parents that uh, had been involved in, you know, the struggle for civil rights and have been active in the civil rights movement, both from where they were from, Baltimore, Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, as well as Chicago. Now, uh, explain to viewers who uh, mostly are gonna be in Southern Arizona, what the South Side <laughs> uh, denotes for Chicago. <laughs> well, uh, Chicago is, uh, it's more your working class, mm -hmm. uh, uh, predominantly minority, low income communities. Uh, I lived in an area that was very, very integrated uh, and uh, that was something that I was very, you know, was, was part of life and uh, was really the ideal that we all wanted to have, you know, fully integrated neighborhoods. Uh, and one of my very formative experiences was uh, singing in a choir. It was an all city choir. Uh, it operated out of the First Unitarian Church on Chicago's South Side. And uh, the choir really kind of took from uh, schools all over the city, and we would we would practice twice a week, and then we would go on tours, uh, actually around the country. So we both, you know, sang, you know, at churches and community events, and you know, art fairs and you know, business openings. Uh, but we also uh, traveled around. We traveled around the South uh, several times. East Coast, uh, and it was that experience of, you know, if you're in a choir, 
you know, you really, you really rely on, everybody has got to, you know, pull their own weight and every, everybody's relying on you. You know, I was a second soprano and if I didn't come in with, you know, my lines, you know, the song did not go well. Uh, and, uh, we have a visitor. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, speaking of which, yeah, uh, this is my father, Ron Engel. Talk about my Hi, Ron. Good growing to meet up you. in Chicago. <laughs> this is Mike Chicago. Bryant. Yes, right for an interview. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Do you want to say? From Chicago? No. <laughs> uh, well, I was born there in Cook County Hospital, but oh my goodness, that was I was just there for a, a very short period of time, well, not that, long enough to that's appreciate. That's a very significant <laughs> experience, believe me. <laughs> Cook County Hospital. Was, right. We were just talking to that. Right. Talking to a nurse. Uh, right. Who, uh, uh, up at Banner, who uh, had gotten two years training there, and she said I was prepared for anything after that. <laughs> and I must say, we yeah. Uh, we have some experiences too. Okay, let you guys okay, go okay. on. Okay, okay. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. So, uh, you you mentioned uh, your background uh, and things about your community when you're growing up. What? And, yeah. Okay. If you want to continue, that's fine. But I, I do well, have a question. Just to a follow-up kind of question. Pull those things together. Uh, there was both a interest in uh, you know civil rights, equality, mm -hmm. yeah. opportunity, uh, but also in the environment. And they were also, they were very, very connected as my growing up, um, you know, especially as it was very apparent to me that, uh, you know, kids in the inner city, you know, didn't have much opportunity to really enjoy, you know, the beautiful environment. Uh, the air was polluted. Uh, they couldn't get out. Uh, and yet um, I did actually have that privilege as the daughter of two teachers. We had our, we had summers that were more free and uh, we could get out into some beautiful natural areas that both uh, made me really value the environment but also made me very committed to issues of environmental justice as I believe everyone should have uh, access to a clean environment and to what that what that brings for their life. So may, many people may not know but you do practice environmental and water law and, and teach it and have for many years. So that's when your conviction to your, your determination to, to follow that path formed was in your childhood then? Yes, yes, um, absolutely. I went, you know, my, I pursued that in terms of what I did in, in college. Um, I ended up working for a state environmental protection uh, department, uh, Connecticut, uh, one summer. I, um, uh, uh, I became a park ranger in the National Park Service. I can uh, see you in the uniform. <laughs> yes. Oh, that was a great experience. Yeah, bad. Uh, and uh, and then I went to law school with that mm -hmm. as a, as a, as an well, end you goal. Touched, you touched very briefly on a, on a couple of the, the key things that are central to your political philosophy, but could you ex elaborate a little bit uh, about the core convictions that you have as a result of that upbringing and background and experience in life? Well, I'm, I'm very committed to equality and opportunity, and I feel that government has a very important role in bringing that about uh, and uh, working to correct market failures, uh, to put it in sort of an economic context, uh, but to really uh, enhance uh, people's quality of life and make sure that we are living, you know, sustainably in uh, our environment and that everybody has access to clean air, clean water uh, and uh, open space uh, and that we are not living uh, basically outside the boundaries of uh, our natural world. You know, you must be a really good lawyer because you just predicted my next question. And that's what is the proper role of government in our society and in our lives? Well, I'm, 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 let me, let me yeah. frame that a little bit based on our <laughs> yeah. context here today, just days after Dobbs being struck down. So you may want to touch on, on that particular intrusion of government into our lives too. Well, uh, first of all, you know, government has to be directed by people. And uh, it's not something that directs people around, people direct their government. And, uh, you know, one of the most frustrating things that we've been seeing is uh, this sort of movement here in Arizona for politicians to dictate the outcome of elections. And I know in just a little while, we're gonna have another one of these January 6th hearings 
which shows how uh, President Trump and the Republican Party it started six minutes uh, ago. <laughs> right, right. We're working toward that. Uh, but also, I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, the role of government is not to dictate people's uh, personal lives, uh, uh, to uh, stay clear and uh, 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 I do believe that people have individual rights and freedoms that the government needs to respect uh, and uh, that this is really fundamental to our uh, democracy and actually to our constitutional system. Uh, and uh, the, the Dobbs decision uh, overturning Roe versus Wade is a complete repudiation, I think, of uh, the direction of our democracy, which has been to enhance individual rights and freedoms in our society and it's a it's a huge retrenchment of that um, and I'm, I'm very worried I'm worried about our next generation as a as a mom of a teenager who's you know she's 17 and a half years old right now soon to be 18 the world that she's entering is a scary one uh, and I think those of us who are fortunate enough to uh, be uh, have you know to be in public life and have the opportunity to be in public office, we need to be doing something about this. But I also gather that you have, that you feel the government does have a role, uh, a positive role uh, in our in our in our lives, not just staying out of the way and staying out of our private lives, but to actually promote some good. Would you talk well, about absolutely. your feelings around that? Right, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, the commitment to equality um, that is in our constitution, uh, also to uh, and. Uh, making sure that we realize every person's potential. And, you know, as I mentioned, you know, getting into public office really was spurred by supporting public education. And I think that works back to my philosophy in terms of realizing the potential of every individual. Can you describe for us the, the future of the society you'd like to help us create if you were to be elected to, to Congress? Well, it is one in which uh, people are uh, do have fundamental freedoms over their personal lives. Uh, also, uh, one in which uh, we are equal. We really uh, eliminate the scourge of, of racism and uh, uh, discrimination against our LGBTQ communities. Uh, we've seen um, a lot of that lately. Uh, also, this uh, scapegoating of uh, transgender kids in uh, the Arizona legislature and all over the country. Uh, so uh, equality uh, and also one where we have a much more participatory uh, democracy. First of all, you know, we, we've been having, we've been struggling just to have, uh, uh, to, to have the, you know, uh, an end to this meddling in, in voting here in Arizona. and. Uh, efforts to undercut, you know, people's voting rights, make it more burdensome here in Arizona. Uh, so that has absolutely got to stop and we need to guarantee voting rights. Um, but voting isn't all, you know, we really do need to really engage people in our democracy. And I think we need to do that, um, you know, really have our young people, uh, you know, make sure that we're really uh, reaching out and that, you know, folks, our indigenous uh, communities are really involved. Uh, so I think that, you know, civic engagement is not just voting. It is, you know, working on what do we want to see out of government mm -hmm. uh, and how do we, um, how do we include those voices into our polity so yeah. that they're actually having, having some influence. Well, speaking of what we want out of government, maybe you could address uh, some more uh, kitchen table issues like uh, health care, uh, wages, inflation, you know, the economy in general and people's, uh, people's material security. What would you like to see in our future in that regard? Well, I'd like to see people uh, having, you know, that economic security uh, and not worrying about that. Uh, and uh, we don't have that right now. Uh, there's constant threats to that. And of course, right now, you know, people are reeling from inflation and high gas prices. Uh, Juice. And, uh, you know, for people on fixed incomes, this is really an issue. Uh, 
uh, and uh, for a lot of people, just finding affordable housing has been a real problem. Yeah. So, you know, things that we can do. I mean, one of the one of the things that I've been talking about on the campaign trail has to do with prescription drugs, and uh, the fact that here in the United States we paid three to four times what they pay in other countries on that. And part of that is that it's really hands off that the drug companies just dictate what those prices are. Uh, so one of the things that we can do is to empower Medicare to negotiate uh, the prices of uh, prescription drugs, and that will bring it down not just for people on Medicare, but uh, but others as well. Um, you know, a lot of things we are coming out of the pandemic, uh, and inflation I think has been profoundly uh, impacted by that and uh, hits to the supply, supply chain. So the more we can buy in America, uh, the more we can produce in America of, of things that we need, uh, the more we can avoid being, you know, uh, the, we can avoid the supply chain barriers and delays that are jacking up prices right now. Plus, you know, I, I do think that, you know, we should look at, you know, is, uh, you know, our corporations, um, you know, being greedy and uh, is there price gouging going on? When I was in the Arizona legislature, I introduced legislation to give our state attorney general the power to uh, investigate and pr prosecute price gouging uh, and couldn't get that, couldn't get that past the Republican majority, but mm -hmm. there was a lot of interest in it. And it seems astonishing to me that we don't, uh, that the attorney general of Arizona does not have that power. Now, if you could cast a deciding vote, a decisive victory vote to a solution to a critical issue facing our country, but you knew absolutely it would end your political career right there on the spot, what would that issue be? Uh, I think right now it would be codifying Roe versus Wade into statute. Uh, that, that really has to be, I think, the top priority right now. Uh, and uh, this is this is just uh, such an important issue um, to me, to our uh, to our uh, younger generation. It's 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 just profound to uh, to roll back this right over our own bodies like this. So absolutely, that would be a, a vote I would cast. Yeah, I mean, most women alive today have not lived in in a fashion that they're going to be living from now on. I mean, they've their whole lives. They've had the freedom and equality uh, guaranteed by our constitution and they've just stripped that away. I mean, I think we are still absorbing what that means. Uh, so I, I imagine that you're, you're right. This is going to be a very critical issue going forward. I'd like to hear you um, tell a person watching who thinks that abortion is a sin that extinguishes a potential human life, why it's still a bad idea, even given that, to ban abortion. I think people have to realize that uh, that there is a realm of uh, personal uh, that's your personal life, and uh, something like you know your uh, you know whether or not to reproduce, you know whether or not to go forward with a risky or a uh, unwanted pregnancy, I cannot imagine anything that is more personal. And, uh, you know, this, this does go into areas that people have strong religious views on, and uh, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't legislate on that. You know, we allow people to follow their, their own moral compass on something like this. And I think it's very dangerous for the government to get into the way of uh, legislating. Why is that dangerous? Those. Well, because it's obvious not it's not going to end with just the issue of abortion. And Justice Thomas's dissent has already said, you know, this is not the end. You know, we're going to be looking at uh, these other decisions that have upheld the right to use contraceptives, uh, the right to marry who we love. Uh, uh, and uh, that is, it's, it's clear that they are willing, the Supreme Court, this radical, uh, radical right majority that is now in charge of the Supreme Court, uh, that got, on, got onto the Supreme Court, I would say, from, uh, 
false pretenses uh, is now prepared, it sounds like, very possibly to take those next steps. And that is an intrusion into our private space that is, you know, contrary to our traditions and uh, contrary to uh, our individual rights and I believe how an ordered society uh, can survive. As an attorney, you've probably given this at least some thought, um, and that's how can we put the Supreme Court back in its lane? <laughs> Do you have any ideas or any ideas of what you might support or consider? Were you elected as a member of the House uh, of Representatives to actually get done about it? Well, uh, you know, I think that uh, what we found is that the, the current court uh, reflects uh, some packing that has been done by the uh, by the Republicans. Uh, you know, taking away Obama's ability to uh, appoint Merrick, Merrick Garland to Scalia's uh, spot, uh, uh, fast tracking uh, Amy Cor Coney Barrett weeks with eight, before an well, election. I think it was even less mm -hmm. than that. Yeah, right, weeks before an election. Yeah, absolutely. When a, they uh, said in Obama's case, in Obama's right. case, you know, it's it a year before months. an election. Right. You can't right. have we a can't Supreme do Court that. nominee. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So the, the current court has not been put in place. And then I have to say, you know, what the, the statements that were made by the uh, several of the justices during their nomination hearings uh, seems to be flatly inconsistent with their votes uh, to overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, so um, it seems at the very least we should have hearings on that matter uh, in Congress. And um, yes, uh, you know, let's let's. Uh, uh, I, I certainly am open to um, uh, ideas of whether or not we rebalance the court. Um, I think there's also other things that we can think about doing in the short term. Um, I'm intrigued by a lot of the discussion going on about uh, can we use uh, federal facilities, federal lands? Uh, could the Biden administration uh, lease them to enable uh, uh, us to have uh, clinics that would abor would provide uh, abortion care on federal lands. That's been suggested. I have to make sure that it's consistent with the Hyde Amendment, if the Hyde Amendment is still in effect. Um, uh, but there may, be, there may be other things that we can do as well. We certainly have to make sure that, um, you know, there remains the right to travel, that that is federally protected uh, for women that will need to travel for abortion care. Um, and certainly the use of the U.S. mail for, um, for uh, abortifacents uh, that are uh, sent through the mail. And if you could change one thing about our Constitution, no matter how big it might be, what would that change be and why? Most of our, uh, our rights are uh, phrased in a way that are, um, that are negative. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a reason for that, to give a space for uh, privacy and for uh, individual rights. So, you know, Bill of Rights, you know, not having, um, uh, not having these intrusions um, you don't have by to confine, government. You don't have to confine yourself to the Bill of Rights. You yeah. can do the whole Constitution. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I guess uh, having, um, you know, having more uh, affirmative affirmative um, obligations on government to guarantee equality and respect for privacy. So more of a more of a positive statement more of the 14th, a positive, 14th right. Amendment as opposed to right. don't do this, right. you will do this. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly, right. Excellent. Uh, do you have anything that you'd like to say in closing of this interview uh, to tell people more about yourself, how to how to get a hold of you, and what to, what they what they might want, to, why they might want to come out and support you with more than just their vote. Well, the one thing we haven't touched on really so much is the environment, mm -hmm. and this is a major part of my campaign. Uh, and uh, you know, we time is running out on climate change. Uh, we are living it right now, and we're seeing that in our drought conditions, uh, and. Uh, you know, issues of water are 
really, really critical to Arizona's future. And there's so much that we can do that's very smart about water use in this state that we're not doing now. Uh, and we do need to address climate change. Uh, drought is only gonna get worse. And we really are ground zero here in Arizona in terms of the impacts of climate change. And yet, you know, with all the sunshine that we have, this is just a great opportunity for our economies to invest in renewable energy. So I'd like to emphasize that. I think that is a hugely important uh, 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 area and one of the reasons I'm running for Congress. And we, we need Congress to act on this. And we've seen that the state legislature has done very little on this. Uh, just recently, they've done something on water in this legislative session. Uh, that's good, but uh, not enough. And they still have done just basically nothing on climate change. So um, otherwise, uh, I would invite people to visit our website, which is uh, www.angleforarizona.com. And if they like to help us out, we are, you know, looking for volunteers. We are, you know, going all over the state. We are canvassing, knocking on doors, talking to people about what they want to see in their representative Congress, uh, what, what policies they want to see. Um, and uh, we're also looking for people to, you know, get on the phone and, and talk to voters. So lots, lots to be done and uh, appreciate people's interest and, and of course their vote. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks for being with us and sharing your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.